You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. If you thought the presidential campaign trail was like a war zone, well, now it's actually gotten that title in a new ad from the Biden campaign, War Zone, showing him on his visit to Ukraine. Remember this? He showed up unannounced in Kiev a couple of months ago. And as we consider the forthcoming debate over Ukraine funding and the numbers we just talked about with Mohammed Yunus at Gallup showing support for Ukraine here, actually helping Joe Biden's approval numbers. The campaign is out with this new ad. Let's put an ear on it as we assemble our political panel. Get their take. It was the first time in modern history. Very significant moment on the world stage. That an American president went into a war zone not controlled by the United States. A nearly 40-hour journey in and out of Ukraine. President Biden left Washington, D.C. at 4 a.m. on Sunday. He landed in eastern Poland and then took a nine and a half hour train to Kiev. He entered Ukraine under the cover of night. And in the morning, Joe Biden walked shoulder to shoulder with our allies in the war-torn streets. Sounds like it could be a trailer for a Mission Impossible movie, as I mentioned. He looks like an action hero when the sun came up the next day. Rick Davis joins us now, Bloomberg politics contributor, Republican strategist, along with Lincoln Mitchell, political analyst, Democratic analyst, and lecturer at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Gentlemen, it's great to have you both. Lincoln, thanks for coming back in the mix. Lincoln, I'd love your take on this first. From the view of a Democrat, that might not be completely enthralled with the idea of waging wars around the world here or supporting war efforts. Does this help Joe Biden? And maybe it's not about the war. Maybe it's about him looking young and virile as he showed up in the quote unquote war zone. That's, that's what struck me. And again, I'm here. So I heard the audio and you heard the stress, even just in the audio, how long that trip was, how arduous it was, yes. how he you know, rode down the streets. So this seems to be very much about his, his, showing that he's, you know, he's not too old for the job. Second point, uh, going to your point about the war itself, it's very clear to me that the war, Ukraine's war defending themselves against Russia is on a kind of visceral level what mobilizes the Biden presidency right now. This is the presidency he wants. This is where his passion is. He cares about the other things, but Hmm. this seems to me he sees himself as I'm the guy that is stopping Putin from taking over Europe. We agree or disagree whether or not that's true. Um, I think I think your previous guest, uh, Mr. Yunus, had it exactly right. If this war drags on, if we are mired in a counteroffensive where Ukraine is not making any progress, the question of does it make sense for the United States to continue to give money and Ukrainian people to continue to take civilian and military losses? To get while we're stuck in a stalemate where we're going to have to start talking and start negotiating, that's going to mm-hmm. become a campaign issue. I know uh, from people who are much closer to this than I am that that Putin won't negotiate with Zelensky. He will only negotiate with the United States, which for now means President Biden. So that will become an issue if this drags on. But for, but the other point is that you know Trump will Trump doesn't support Ukraine at all, and once he emerges as once he's formalized as the nominee. That will also potentially be a campaign issue where Trump's, again, kind of shady ties to Putin are going to be hard to ignore. What do you think of this, Rick, as someone who's run campaigns uh, for a number of Republicans, including a a very famous and iconic war veteran here? It's the Democrat that's going to carry the war mantle in this campaign. Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden doesn't have anything to prove about being commander in chief. He's been commander in chief for almost three years, so. I'm a little surprised, actually, that he would take a time out from the debate on the economy to hmm. pitch the Ukraine war. I mean, he just released a week ago uh, a pretty good ad on you know his accomplishments around the economy. Every poll I've seen says the economy is the number one issue in voters' minds. And by and large, the Democratic Party, as Lincoln says, supports the war in Ukraine. And, mm-hmm. and so... Why talk about that now when you've really got the hurdle of the economy? Uh, just seems like an odd U-turn for this president. Uh, I'm glad he did it. I big proponent of the uh, U.S. support for the Ukrainians in their war against Russian aggression. And mm-hmm. I'm worried about making sure we get the necessary funding from Congress. So the timing is good to try and convince Congress 
But I wouldn't spend campaign resources on lobbying Congress. That's what the White House legislative office is for. I think I would focus on the economy if I were still, you know, advising, if I were advising the Biden campaign. Or as Lincoln mentioned, Rick, is this more about showing that he actually has the wherewithal to take that train trip and go around the world, that he is not as old and incapacitated as Republicans suggest? (laughs) It's a great way to lead in. Is he really as old and incapacitated as we say he is? Uh, No, (laughs) but he is a little old and a little incapacitated. Uh, I do think that that's what this ad was about. I think Lincoln and you got it spot on. I think this ad was all about his energy and getting up at four o'clock in the morning and You know, I actually think that the real uh, name of this ad should be Quiet Strength, which is the point they're trying to make, not, you know, that it was a war zone. And uh, I think that, uh, look, it's a good ad. uh, And I do think it addresses some of that uh, uh, issue of his age. Interesting polling data while we're talking about the presidential campaign uh, here, Lincoln, and the idea that it's going to be a Biden-Trump matchup. We've got new data out today that shows former Governor Nikki Haley is actually polling above Joe Biden, beating Joe Biden in a hypothetical right now. Uh, This is a CNN SSRS poll. Uh, Say what you will about it. Haley's got 49 percent. Joe Biden's got 43. So maybe this is a greater concern for this White House than, say, Ron DeSantis. What do you think? Well, pretty much every Democrat I know who is really focusing on this recognizes that Haley, uh, Tim Scott, potentially even Asa Hutchinson, are the strongest candidates against Joe Biden in November of 2024. However, Trump's lead is very strong. And we can't state that strongly enough. You know, we have this way in talking about campaigns of saying it's too it's so early, it's so early, it's so early. You know, if I can make a baseball metaphor, yes, it's like we keep thinking it's the first inning, we wake up and it's the eighth inning. It's not the eighth inning yet, but in this day and age, you know, we're now in basically well, September, you know, 14 months before the general election votes are cast. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people didn't even announce their primary candidacies till around now. But this race, Mm. this primary race on the Republican side has been going on for a long time. And there's very little reason to think that Trump is going to lose it. He, 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 like Biden, is older and might have a health issue, but I can't speak. I can't speak to that. The indictments and the trials do two things. They solidify his base and they keep him in the news, which will only help him. Having said all that, it's absolutely true. Nikki Haley is a stronger general election candidate than Joe Biden. But most people understood that on the Democratic side, you know, months ago. We are in a strange situation here. And I think the poll that you discussed earlier in the segment captures that. The only Republican that Biden has a real chance of beating among the regular, the main major candidates here is Donald Trump. And the only Democrat that Donald Trump has a real shot of beating would be Biden or his vice president. If this were Trump versus Whitmer, Whitmer gets 330 votes. If it's Trump versus Warnock, the same kind of thing. And if it's Scott versus Biden, the Republicans have a real shot. But this is America and nobody wants another Trump-Biden race. And it looks like that's exactly why we're going to have one. Which brings me to Kamala Harris. Asked in two separate interviews, she's at the ASEAN Summit in uh, Jakarta, first by the Associated Press, then by CBS. Are you ready to be president? And and in both interviews, uh, the age issue was brought up as the premise of the question. I want to walk through these very quickly. First asked by the Associated Press about this. Listen to her response. Do you response. feel prepared for that possibility? Uh, and serving as vice president prepared you for, for that job? Yes. Um, and how would you, you know, describe the, that, that process? Which process? Like as far as, you know, being ready for that, that, for that. Well, first of all, let's, I'm answering your hypothetical. Mm-hmm. Um, but Joe Biden's going to be fine. So that is not going to come to fruition. Joe's going to be fine. She says that's the AP. That was a definitive yes before the follow up. Then asked by Margaret Brennan on CBS. This will air on Sunday. The Wall Street Journal had a poll showing two thirds of Democrats say Joe Biden is too old to run again. Are you prepared to be commander in chief? Yes, I am, if necessary. But Joe Biden is going to be fine. Joe Biden's going to be fine, Rick. Is that the answer that the vice president should be delivering? And did you see any variation between these two? The definitive yes, followed by the qualifier? Well, you should never be answering this question. I mean, John McCain had a great line about, like, you know, what vice president should say. Their job is to inquire daily on the health of the president, period. No more. (laughs) I mean, it's just nuts that get... 
that's a hypothetical question, but I'm going to answer it definitively. Yes, I'm prepared. I mean, like who's yeah. briefing her? I mean, that's just horrible. Um, no, I mean, she should not be getting into this speculation. She should be sensitive to the fact that two thirds of her party want to see Biden get out of this race. And she should not get into any discussion of the successorship to Joe Biden, especially because the fact is he's 80 years old. And and mm -hmm. it just reinforces the fact that there could be something that happens to Joe Biden if he wins a second term. How do you answer that question, Lincoln? Is Kamala Harris hearing from Democrats say, hey, stand up, say yes to that. It might happen. I don't think she's hearing that from Democrats, but I think she said basically the right thing. I generally agree, agree uh, with Rick on that, on his assessment of on John McCain's assessment of the vice presidency. And, and I think when John McCain had many strengths as a U.S. senator and was really, you know, a fine uh, senator and a fine American leader, but choosing running mates may not have been his greatest strength. Um, but because the Republican Party, Nikki Haley primarily, but others in the party as well, are making this election about Harris, she needs to go on record and saying, yes, I'm prepared. And, you know, I don't know Kamala Harris, but we do come from the same town. I know a lot of people who know her. And I can assure you it's, that infuriates her. There's a part of her that's saying, why do I get asked this question? Uh, Dan Quayle was, you know, prima facie unqualified and unprepared to be president. Always his running mate was older. He wasn't asked that question. But I think she has to say yes. And then she has to qualify it by saying, look, but Biden's going to be the nominee and and he's going to be fine. So I think she handled a a, a question that she might have seen as inappropriate about as well as, as she could. One guy we're not talking about is Ron DeSantis, uh, Rick Davis, and he had quite a moment today holding a news conference in Jacksonville, Florida, where, of course, that mass shooting took place a couple of weeks ago. We remember him being booed with the first lady when he showed up at a vigil uh, because he does not have a great relationship, I think we can say, uh, in many cases, with the black community in Florida due to a number of issues uh, going back through the history books here, along with, my goodness, I, I, I won't do the whole litany. Uh, he was holding a news conference today uh, when this gentleman stood up to ask a question, it's a somewhat extended exchange. I'd like for you to hear it and tell me how this clearly important moment played either for better or worse. Let's listen. So first of all, uh, I did not allow anything with that. Well, listen, excuse me. I'm not going to let you accuse me of committing criminal activity. I am not going to take that. I am not going to take that. So you, you should, you want to have a civil conversation, that's one thing. Try to say that I'm letting, that guy was Baker acted. He should have been, he should have been ruled ineligible, but they didn't involuntarily commit him. And so they were, no, no, I don't, no, no. There is the truth. There is something about the truth. It's not everyone doesn't have their own truth. No. You don't get to come here and, and, and blame me for some madman. That is not appropriate. And I'm not going to accept it. You have, you have allowed people to hunt people like me. Oh, that, that is nonsense. Get, that is such nonsense. We if you didn't hear him, he said, you have allowed people to hunt people like me, uh, the audience member in that back and forth with Ron DeSantis. This is very sensitive stuff, Rick, but it's a moment for a candidate. Does this help or hurt Ron DeSantis? You know, look, I think that this reinforces the Ron DeSantis we're getting to know, which is he's a combative guy. He's 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 not going to sort of be kinder and gentler on the campaign trail. Uh, he's not going to uh, tolerate people interrupting him in a crowd, whether it's uh, deserved or not. And uh, and he's going to stand his ground. So. Uh, th this just reinforces to me that this is the Ron DeSantis that they want us to see and hear. Um, it's just who he is, I think. It's just a matter of practicality. It's the truth, as he says it. And um, mm. and I think voters are going to have to sort of, if they want Ron DeSantis to be their nominee, they're going to have to get used to that. And it's a little different, right? It's not your typical approach to dealing with people in uh, crowds that, that ask hard questions or even questions that aren't accurate. Most people who ask questions, aren't accurate, but they get answered anyway, because uh, it's the candidates, uh, really their obligation to have this conversation with people in a crowd. And, you know, he just chooses a different path. We'll see whether or not it's been effective. It hasn't been to date, um, but yeah. uh, he's doubling down on that approach. Well, it sure seems to be the case. We'll see how this resonates. Uh, it's a moment that I wanted to identify uh, while we had our panel with us. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch the program live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We bring in Congresswoman Susan Del Bene. I'm glad to say the Democrat from Washington is back with us on Sound On, Chair Emeritus of the New Democrat Coalition, Chair of the DCCC. Congresswoman, it's great to see you. And what I guess is your last week of freedom here. I know you're back in Washington next week. And so uh, I'd love to start there. It's great to have you, by the way, with us on YouTube. It's a big week for us on Sound On, and it's good to actually see you while we're talking here. Uh, Are you prepared to vote for a continuing resolution if it avoids a government shutdown? Well, I think um, our first priority always is to make sure we have good funding for the entire fiscal year. Unfortunately, Republicans have avoided doing the work that is necessary to come up with legislation that can fund the government that has strong support in the House and the Senate and um, will be signed by the president. So a Mm -hmm. continuing resolution can be a backstop, but um, the concern there is what they're going to attach to a continuing resolution, um, what requirements they're going to put in place. So we really need to see what legislation they might propose um, to put on the floor sure. of the House. Well, to put a finer point on it, the news today is that Speaker McCarthy uh, wants to detach the supplemental request for Ukraine funding and and simply go ahead with funding for FEMA for disaster relief and the border. Is that something you could stomach or do you need to have the full request in a CR? Well, I, you know, the number one thing is the fiscal year ends at the end of this month. And, uh, and we're in a place where folks don't know what's going to happen on October 1st. So we need to provide that certainty. We have, we can provide strong funding, but whatever they're going to try to attach and and what that is and the substance of it is going to be very, very important to see. And I don't think they know yet. I don't think um, Speaker McCarthy knows what he's going to put on the floor or even what his caucus would support. Um, So he needs to figure that out. But if he was willing to work with all of us and work with the Senate to have um, a clean, continuing resolution to keep the government funded, that would be a great way to move forward. We're having an important conversation about AI, and it's one that you have waded into in an op-ed in Newsweek that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, We've heard uh, Senator Chuck Schumer say that he's working on a bipartisan approach here uh, to get some regulatory legislation in the works. It's kind of hard to imagine that happening in the climate that we're in. But in your op-ed, you're talking about privacy here, and, and you say the first step is a national privacy law. Is there an appetite for it on Capitol Hill? Well, there has been. And I really think that as we look at technology policy broadly, we have to start with the fundamentals. And the most fundamental piece is privacy. Um, Privacy means you being able to protect protect your most sensitive personal information, not allowing people to take information about you in many cases that you aren't even aware of. Um, and use that information in ways that you don't expect or sell that information. Um, It's very important that we have federal consumer data privacy legislation. And we have some states who put some pieces of legislation in place, um, policies in place, but we need one consistent federal law so that your data is protected everywhere. And it's also Mm -hmm. incredibly important because that's policy that we need to bring to the international table as we talk about what international policy looks like. When we don't have domestic policy, we um, really struggle to set direction where we think international policy should go. So data is a place to start because what feeds AI? Lots and lots of data. And we should make sure that um, we're protecting data as the first place to start. Well, we know it's creeping into the political space, and I'm sure you saw the headlines today about Google. This feels like a moment uh, to me as well. We've seen AI and you know deep fakes creep into some political ads, uh, not to mention the way campaigns might be able to use that as an organizing tool. But look at this now. Political ads using AI on Google and YouTube must soon be accompanied by essentially a watermark, a prominent disclosure if imagery or sounds have been synthetically altered. 
Are we getting our arms around this congresswoman or is it moving too fast for us to do so? Well, first, I'd say um, from a policy standpoint, we're behind because, as I talked about privacy legislation, we should already have privacy legislation, federal privacy legislation in place. That's why I have such a great sense of urgency about that. Um, But you're going to continue as we continue to battle misinformation, disinformation that folks are seeing and um, what the impact AI can have. You're going to continue to see organizations try to figure out what they think um, an environment should look like, how they should uh, make sure that misinformation, disinformation, or at least what type of labeling should be out there to highlight um, anything that might have been manipulated so folks are aware. Um, But I actually think there's an important role for the government to play in putting Mm -hmm. policies in place to really describe what the rules of the road are going forward. And we haven't done a good job of that, folks. It's a complicated issue, um, but folks have been hesitant to put policy in place. And that's why I go back to privacy, because that's the fundamental building block. We've had legislation we've debated um, and looked at, um, and we need to move here so that we can continue then to build on um, all these other issues that are going to continue to either continue to move forward and become problematic or um, or issues we don't even know about yet that are going to come up and, um, and mm-hmm. that we're going to need to tackle. So we need to make this a priority. We need to move quickly. Well, we sure do. Uh, I don't know how many of your colleagues know as much about this as you do, but they need to start catching up quick because this is a very important story for us here at Bloomberg, and it's one that we'd like to stay in touch with you on. Uh, Congresswoman, your colleague from Massachusetts, Seth Moulton, was calling for uh, a Geneva Convention for AI. There's a whole military side to this as well. We could talk about this all afternoon uh, if we wanted to. But getting to this from a privacy standpoint, I'd be very curious to see how much progress you can make here. Our, our viewers and listeners should know that, as I mentioned, you're chair of the DCCC. This is the agency that is actually tasked with getting Democrats elected and reelected in the election cycle. You've got a lot on your plate going into this new year. Are you going to take the majority back from Kevin McCarthy? Um, The American people are with us. Um, That's why we'll take back the majority because folks want to see governance work. Um, They want responsible leaders who are going to tackle issues and help move us forward. And what we see now is chaos and confusion and dysfunction from the House Republicans. They are being led by their most extreme members of their caucus and um, continue to move more and more to the extreme. And we're seeing that dysfunction right now as they put us on a fast track to a shutdown. So we need responsible leaders. We need folks who can legislate. We saw what we could get done when we had uh, Congress led by folks um, who wanted to focus on the issues the American people care about, like infrastructure and bringing jobs back to the U.S., manufacturing jobs back in the U.S., um, making sure that we're tackling the climate crisis and the cost of prescription drugs. Um, all of these are things that we did last Congress and with strong leadership. And we can do again if we have strong leaders. But unfortunately, that is not at all what we see in the Republican House in particular. To what extent, if we have a government shutdown, and I know that you've weighed in on that, you don't obviously don't want to see that happen, but for a lot of people in Washington, it's a foregone conclusion. For some members of the Freedom Caucus, Congresswoman, uh, they're actually asking for that. They said, don't fear the shutdown. There's going to be a whole blame game that follows there based on what happened. Is that advantage Democrats, in your view, well, if the government shuts seen- down this year? Unfortunately, we've seen shutdowns before, um, and they have a broad um, impact across the country um, and are incredibly, incredibly damaging to our communities. They're incredibly damaging to our economy for no reason at all. Um, We can absolutely make sure that government stays running and continues to do the important work that it does. But if we Mm -hmm. shut down just because we have these extreme members of the Republican um, House who don't care, um, that's going to have an impact on our communities. Folks aren't going to be able to 
get answers to questions they have from the federal government. Um, mm -hmm. Things where folks are waiting for decisions on benefits or immigration issues, et cetera, will continue to be backlogged, will be backlogged longer. Um, we Funding that goes out for programs or even to families will all be stopped because there will be people to continue to move that forward. Um, it, all for no reason. So mm -hmm. uh, it's terrible that folks even consider that an option or um, something that they think would be okay. Um, it shows again how extreme yeah. the Republican Party has become and the dysfunction in the Republican House. Well, I'll tell you what, coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking with uh, retired Marine Corps General Arnold Panaro about Tommy Tummerville's block on military promotions uh, which, as we've discussed many times here, is an objection to the abortion policy at the Pentagon. Uh, this is something that's got people really fired up on Capitol Hill on, on both sides of the aisle, frankly. But Democrats, in many cases, are outraged by it. Frankly, a lot of Republicans are, too. I won't ask you to weigh in on the blockade, Congresswoman, but to what extent will abortion and access to reproductive health care uh, be a major issue in this campaign to the extent that we saw in the midterms? It already is a major issue. Um, we're hearing um, from folks across the country and you've even seen at elections that have taken place more recently, um, the impact of this policy. Um, folks across the country strongly stand with making sure women can make their own reproductive health decisions. They know and can see um, that this isn't Republicans talking about a state's rights issue. They are moving towards um, yeah. trying to put in place a national abortion ban. That is their goal. But that'll they be part of your them. messaging. You're going to you're going to beat the drum on that in this campaign. But it's what we're seeing right now. Um, and people understand that. And it's had an impact in local elections, whether it's in what we saw in Ohio, um, recent elections in Wisconsin and Kansas. Um, Folks mm -hmm. understand that Republicans are trying to push for a national abortion ban. This is about health care, basic health care for uh, across the country, about people being able to make their own decisions about reproductive freedom. It is an issue today and absolutely um, has an impact on the election next year. Well, I know you've got some very busy weeks and months ahead in Congresswoman. I'm glad you could join us here at the tail end of your, I won't say August recess, but we'll we'll meet you back here in the Capitol. And thank you for joining us on the radio and on YouTube today on Bloomberg. Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, Democrat from Washington, chair of the DCCC, with some interesting insights as we look ahead to campaign season. You're listening to the Bloomberg Sound On Podcast. Catch the program live weekdays at 1 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. Look who I found. If you're on YouTube, <laughs> you can even see Kaylee Lines is back in the country and back on the fastest show in politics. Welcome back. It's good to we be missed back. You. It's great to see you. you. We have a lot to talk about. Funny, not many stories have changed <laughs> in the two weeks since you've been on this broadcast, including uh, the Tuberville blockade. Yep. 301 military promotions, as many as 650 by the end of the year, if this continues, still on hold. We talked last evening on Balance of Power with uh, Senator Michael Bennett. Democrat from Colorado, not a fan of Tommy Tuberville, and did a lot of arguing over the Space Command. Remember, it was Colorado versus Alabama. Right. Colorado wins. It's going to stay there. Uh, but one of many members of Congress, Senate, and the House, for that matter, calling him out to drop the blockade. Here he is. His position yep. is wrong on the law, extreme on the politics, and and he should relent because we're now at a position where we have 300 people that have spent their entire lives dedicated to service of this country that are now in the position to lead the Marine Corps, to lead the Navy, to lead mm -hmm. the Army, who now cannot take up their post and whose family right. cannot make plans to move to that post because of Tommy Tuberville's extreme position on abortion. Kaylee, he was so animated that our photographer had to pan out because he was stepping out of the frame. Uh, this is something that really lights up lawmakers, depending yeah. on which side they're on. 
It, it does. And it becomes a question. You're hearing it a lot from the Democrats who say this is a Republican problem. Chuck mm-hmm. Schumer says, I'm not going to bring all of these to the floor for a flow, floor vote, which theoretically he could do. He's worried about the precedent it would set. He yes. says this is Republicans' problem to fix. And it becomes a question of if he if Tuberville is going to get more pressure from inside his own party mm-hmm. to blink. But he says he's holding firm on this. And, and the end result could be we might not have a chair of the Joint Chiefs. That's right. If this goes on. And it appears that that's a likely scenario. He actually issued a statement today saying my holds are not affecting national security. No matter what national pundits are saying, this is just another example of woke propaganda. Glad to say the general is back. Uh, General Panaro, who we've talked to about this before, retired Major General Arnold Panaro. U.S. Marine Corps, it's great to have you back, sir. As you hear the latest on this, we're at 301 now. This blockade has been going on for six months. How much longer do you think it'll last? Well, Joe and Kaylee, uh, privileged to be back. And unfortunately, right now, it reminds me of the movie about the Pentagon called No Way Out. There doesn't appear to be (laughs) any white smoke that you would have when they find a pope or uh, any resolution in the near term. So it looks like, uh, unfortunately, Uh, This this is going to last for a long, long time. It's already now in its eight months. So it's been there a quite substantial amount of time. And frankly, I would say this is not a political issue. This is a national security issue. And the notion that somehow this is not affecting adversely our overall national security and the leadership at the highest levels of our military, frankly, points out how clueless Senator Tuberville is about national security. Okay, so General, talk to us more about that, about the national security risk here. Is this more about our adversaries' perceptions of U.S. military strength, or is it affecting daily operations? I mean, really, what tangible is changed because of these holdups? Kaylee, I would say both. It certainly affects our adversaries' perceptions of our ability to uh, uh, carry out our contingency plans to deter them, when they see that we're not putting the best leaders we have in charge of our military formations. And it affects day-to-day operations in in big ways and small ways. Let me give you just a couple of examples. You're now in the Marine Corps. You you, you don't have a commandant. You have an assistant commandant, and he's doing two full-time four-star jobs. Same thing in the Navy. Same thing in the Army. You don't have the combatant commanders, the warfighting commanders, the four-star commanders of the Cyber Command which is a huge issue for us at National Security Now, or the Northern Command that's designed to protect the United States of America. So this notion that Senator Tuberville has, that it doesn't make a difference who's in charge, uh, there's a huge difference between a colonel and a four-star general. I was a two-star general. I've been a one-star general. The amount of time that you spend in the General Officer Corps to get to the highest levels is different, 15 to 20 years more experience. And I've use these examples so the person can understand it. If you have a serious brain tumor and you're going to have an operation, do you want the resident that's been doing it for a year that's done four operations? Or do you want the senior surgeon that's been doing it for 20 years and done a thousand operations? That's the difference between a colonel and a one star and a four star at these highest levels of command. So it has, and and the other thing is it ought to be emotional. When you look at the adverse impact on families and on on military personnel that have gone in harm's way on more than one combat tour. I can speak with personal experience here. Uh, They're holding up their lives. They're holding up their their wives and spouses. They can't go to their next job. Their kids can't enroll in the school where they're supposed to be. Uh, At the lower Mm -hmm. levels, Colonel to one star, one star to two star, they've already lost $55,000 in pay and benefits. So the notion somehow that this has no impact it just shows me again, Senator Tuberville never served in uniform. He's never heard a shot fired in anger. He truly is clueless about what is going on. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, Tommy Tuberville said on Fox News uh, they need to get rid of wokeness in the Navy because seamen are, quote, doing poetry on aircraft carriers, unquote. You mentioned the movie No Way Out, one of my favorites, which I will always associate with with what they showed as the Georgetown Metro stop, something that does not exist. Does Tommy Tuberville have any idea of what exists in the U.S. military? Well, well, let's talk about an aircraft carrier. A 90,000-ton Nimitz-class carrier or a Ford-class carrier, 5,500 sailors, some Marines for security, for particularly if you have certain type of weapons on there, 
uh, you know, 10 decks and, and one of those 5,500 sailors might like reading poetry. Maybe he's reading Robert Frost. That doesn't make him woke. So the notion somehow, I don't even know what woke is. People keep using this all the time. I don't even know what woke is. And I can tell you no at the war does. fighting levels, when you're deployed at sea on a carrier or you're in a submarine and you go under the sea for six months at a time and you have no communication back home and know what's going on because you don't want the enemy to know where you are and you want the Chinese to understand mm. that if they start messing with Taiwan, our Navy can sink their Navy and it's primarily going to be submarines. Again, he just does not fundamentally understand what our military is, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and the fact that they're in harm's way, like the 82nd Airborne. The mothers and fathers that send their sons and daughters to serve in the military, and two of my sons have served in the military, we expect them to be the best trained, best equipped, and best led. When you don't allow the leaders that we have picked to be our top leaders to lead our military formations, um, you're not giving them the best lead. In Tommy Tuberville in Auburn versus Alabama, uh, if his first-string quarterback was ready to play, he would not put his first-string quarterback in against Alabama. Well, that's what we're doing right now vis-a-vis -vis China, North Korea, and Iran. Hmm. Wow. All right, General. Well, we've heard a lot of your opinion on what Senator Tuberville is doing here. Let's hear from the senator himself just a little bit of what he's had to say on this matter recently. I'm not holding up any... Uh, uh, nominations from being approved. Uh, they can bring them one at a time to the floor. They have chosen not to do that. I've also talked to some of the nominees that's come through my office uh, through their posture hearings. They have already changed jobs. They're already doing the job. It's just they've got interim on their name. There's no threat to readiness. The people that we need to be really worried about are her colonels and majors and and sergeants and privates, they're the people who get ready to fight wars. The people up here in the Pentagon, I don't know what they do every day, but they're more of of uh, giving advice. Mm. So this is something that the senator posted on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, earlier today. Just on that part there, General, about how the Senate theoretically could solve this, bring them one by one to the floor. I know what your message is to Senator Tuberville. What's your message message to Senator Schumer on this? Well, I'll give you that message, but let me say again, his notion about who fights and wins our wars is just nonsense because it's second lieutenants, it's captains, it's colonels. And by the way, colonels are being held up to go to one star. So he's affecting them. I've been in combat. I've been in Vietnam. I've been an infantry platoon commander and it takes everybody. You don't just do it with the enlisted. You do it with officers enlisted. You do it with senior commanders, et cetera. In terms of, of the process in the Senate, first of all, I would say, Senator Tuberville could have offered an amendment in the markup to block this policy he's opposed to. He hasn't read the book, How Our Laws Are Made. That's how you change a policy you disagree with. He was a coward. He didn't bring it up in committee. He didn't bring it up on the floor of the Senate when the bill, the Vince bill was being debated. The appropriation bill is coming up. Why doesn't he offer an amendment on the appropriation bill to block this policy? If he thinks we have too many admirals and generals, put an amendment in to cut the number. And so I would say the burden is on him. I don't believe the burden is on Senator Schumer. The reason you can't use the cloture process for 300 plus is number one, just the time sequence. And it takes two to three days to basically deal with one nomination through that process. Uh, there isn't, yeah. you couldn't get to him. Number two, we don't want to politicize the military. The military is nonpartisan. Uh, these admirals and generals that are up for promotion had nothing to do with this policy. We have totally politicized the federal judges with cloture. So I, I don't see the burden is on Senator Schumer to basically do what Senator Tuberville has done, which is politicize our military. Well, you, you called him a coward, General. I just wonder your your thoughts about his constituents, because Tommy Tuberville says he's got a great deal of support in Alabama and they're telling him to hang in there, uh, Coach Tommy. He is representing a certain attitude in American politics right now, isn't he? Well, I would say if he is, and I don't know that for a fact, I have a lot of friends in Alabama. I have a lot of people that I work with in industry. I have a lot of retired friends in Alabama. They don't agree with what he's doing. Maybe there are some people that agree with him. Yeah, there are a lot of people out there that claim our military is too woke. I don't even know what woke is. Show me the facts. Show me the evidence, and, and, and I'll take yeah. a look. But just because he says he has some support, um, I, I know for a fact that senators 
on the Armed Services Committee that have served in uniform and gone in harm's way have told him, you know, to his face, this is the wrong thing to do. Don't do this. And so, mm. sure, I'm sure he's got some people that agree with him, but he's got a lot of people that don't agree with him. But that's not the issue, whether he has people that agree with him or not. This is the wrong thing to do, politicizing our military, keeping our major combat formations from being led by the top people that we want to lead those formations. The 82nd Airborne, the Marine Expeditionary Force, they could get and in, go into harm's way in five minutes or 10 minutes or 25 minutes. You, you don't have time to basically deal with it when you're in the military and, you're, and you've got to be ready to go 24-7. Mm-hmm. General, finally, and we only have about a minute left, but you were just talking about the process of lawmaking on Capitol Hill, and we know that there is a very difficult process we're staring down the barrel of to get government funding passed uh, by the deadline of September 30th. How would a government shutdown affect military red- readiness, and how could Tuberville's bo- blockade pen- potentially compound those effects? Well, a shutdown of government is the worst thing that could happen. Already, Congress hasn't done their work. They're not going to be able to pass the appropriation bills by 1 October. So we're going to be in another for 25 straight years continuing resolution where you limp the government along at the previous year level and you can't do new things. You can't have the new programs against China. You can't beef up Ukraine and Taiwan. But a shutdown basically puts everybody out of business. You, you, you'll have the essential mm-hmm. people that come in. They don't get paid. Uh, You can't train, you can't fly, you can't operate. It would be devastating uh, to our national security. And uh, as bad as a hole on these flag and general officers are, uh, it shuts them down again, too. It shuts everybody down. It's just a really, really bad outcome. And that's from a Marine. General, it's great to have you. We really do appreciate the time. Retired Major General Arnold Pinaro with us here on Bloomberg Sound On. One of many fired up about this in Washington, Kaylee. Yeah, nothing seems to evoke emotion. Isn't that something? As much as this particular issue right now. It doesn't matter who you bring it up with on one end or the other. Thanks for listening to the Sound On podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at 1 p.m. Eastern Time at Bloomberg.com.